It is time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up, a government medical panel put out new guidelines this week for when and how often women should be screened for breast cancer. But they are sparking debate among doctors. Here's John with more. Look straight in here. 44-year-old Paula Pereira just had a mammogram. She's done that every year since turning 40. Between me and my doctor, we've decided that I need to stay with having my yearly screening mammography. That's for my peace of mind. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force says women of average risk should make an individual choice about whether to screen between the ages of 40 and 49 and be screened every other year between 50 and 74. Studies suggest screening mammography is about twice as effective at saving lives in women 50 to 59 as in women 40 to 49. Still, in that younger age group, about four deaths are prevented for every 10,000 women screened over 10 years. Some doctors worry about the message these new guidelines may be sending to younger women. Dr. Freya Schnabel is the director of breast surgery at NYU Langone. We have to remember that women in their 40s and below still get breast cancer. In your view, are we overemphasizing now the potential harms, including worry on the part of the patient? I think the worry issue is something that particularly, in my opinion, is very troublesome as a reason to avoid mammography. Why? Well, when I'm getting my blood pressure checked in my doctor's office, it makes me a little nervous. That's not a reason for me not to have my blood pressure checked. Adult women are capable of understanding that sometimes we all have to do things that we're not crazy about, but there's a long-term benefit. Dr. Michelle Blackwood, chief of the breast program at St. Barnabas Medical Center, agrees the new guidelines can be confusing. The problem is that with all these recommendations, right now that we're splitting hairs when it comes to the statistics, we're splitting hairs when it comes to when they should be having them, and I think that women and their doctors are having a really tough time of it. So what are the factors that you would say a patient and the doctor should be considering? Well, first of all, you got to emphasize these recommendations are for women at average risk. If you have a strong family history of breast cancer, if you've had genetic testing and you're at increased risk, that's a different conversation. But for the women at average risk, it's totally personalized. So what they're saying here is, look, there is a consensus. Mammography saves lives, no question about it. And statistically, in terms of risks and benefits, there's a sweet spot between 50 and 74. But then you have that discussion with your, your, your doctor and say, what is your own tolerance for false positives? If you want to be as aggressive as possible and you want to make sure that there's the lowest possible chance of dying from breast cancer, you may be more aggressive knowing that if you screen under the age of 50, you're going to increase your risk of false positives. How, what impact do these recommendations have for, for women who do want to get mammograms in their 40s in terms of insurance coverage? Right, right. Anthony, this is probably the most important point when we look at it sort of from a broad clinical uh, perspective. Now, the task force, to be clear, doesn't directly tell insurers what they should and shouldn't cover, but they have a huge influence. So under the Affordable Care Act, insurers have to, private insurers, have to offer at least the bare minimum screening at as defined by the task force. Uh, so one huge concern is that by sliding um, mammogram guidelines back from age 40 to age 50, eventually insurers will stop paying for it. Now, Congress did create a little carve out to that rule that protects uh, women, at least through 2017. Women uh, between the ages of 40 and 50 can have an annual mammogram that's paid for by insurance. Uh, but after 2017, we're going to have to see what happens. So if you're saying it's a personal decision, you can't have it both ways. You yeah. can't right. say, talk, talk to your doctor, but by the way, we're not going to cover it. Right. Mm. You have to cover it. Aside from the fear, though, I have to say that is the test I dread the most in the future, just because every woman you ever hear says it's horrible. It's tremendously painful. Yeah, it, it's a definitely an uncomfortable test. There are concerns about exposure to radiation, although discomfort is generally, yeah, you, you know, less less worrisome than breast cancer itself. Right. So it, there's a balance. I know that if Dr. Schnabel were here, that she would take issue with tremendously uncomfortable, and then people would say, you're a guy, how do you know? But she has said, yes, there is discomfort, no question about it. Um, and if it had to be guys, people say there would be this gentle right. device with air blowing up and all this stuff. <laughs> but, but you think about the potential right. for saving your life. So, All right. The fight against cancer was also on President Obama's mind this week. In his State of the Union address, the president announced one final ambitious goal, a so-called moonshot to cure cancer, with the vice president leading the effort. 
for the loved ones we've all lost, for the families that we can still save. Let's make America the country that cures cancer once and for all. This is not the first time, of course, that we've heard a president talk about cancer during the State of the Union. Richard Nixon did in 1971. So, Holly, what's different about this effort? Right. I mean, I think one of the things that sort of distinguishes this effort is that it has sort of three very clear and ideally achievable uh, initiatives. The first is to increase resources for, for research. By re increasing resources, we mean increasing money, right? Increasing funding for both public and private sector uh, research. The next step is to do what we call breaking down information silos. So there can be two groups of researchers working in tandem, but not communicating with each other, right? They're not giving Giving each other information the moment that it happens and that slows down right the advancement of, of research overall um, and another big issue is educating people about clinical trials and trying to get rid of some of the red tape that keeps people who qualify for clinical trials out of them uh, getting more people involved gives us more information and ultimately will advance us toward a cure well finally from us this morning the midlife crisis has provided material for decades of sitcoms it may have helped sell a few sports cars too but does it really exist <laughs> university of alberta researchers track the happiness of two groups of canadians one from age 18 to 43 and another from age 23 to 37. They found that people were actually happier in their early 40s than they were at 18. Because of this, the researchers say the midlife crisis may just be a myth. <laughs> I, I have to say, my interpretation of this research when I, when I, when I read the piece, I, it seems that midlife happiness and midlife crisis may be the opposite side of the same coin. Mm -hmm. right? oh, Some of yeah. the things that make us happy in midlife is that we no longer have uncertainty. What is yeah. our life going to be like? Yeah. How are we going to support ourselves? But on the other hand, that can be seen sort of as a loss of hope and dreams, which yes. uh, can translate into a crisis. So I think it all depends on how you interpret it in that moment. All right. Dr. John LaPoupe, Dr. Holly Phillips, thank you both so much.